Great. This is um, Rex, the Relationship Economy Expedition. This is uh, kind of the first call of a re reconstructed, rethought Rex, and uh, we're going to be diving into a whole lot of issues that center around trust. Uh, and uh, I'll explain as we as we go into this. But I usually start Rex uh, meetings with a poem, and I just thought that um, this meeting, uh, the, the poem that I'd love to read is creates the energy that I think uh, I'd love us to have in Rex. So it's a, it's a poem that we read at our wedding. So April is my, my better half, and it's called Summons by Robert Francis. It goes as follows. Keep me from going to sleep too soon, or if I go to sleep too soon, come wake me up. Come any hour of night, come whistling up the road, stomp on the porch, bang on the door, make me get out of bed and come and let you in and light a light. Tell me the northern lights are on and make me look. Or tell me clouds are doing something to the moon they never did before and show me. See that I see. Talk to me till I'm half as wide awake as you and start to dress wondering why I ever went to bed at all. Tell me the walking is superb. Not only tell me, but persuade me. You know I'm not too hard persuaded. So welcome. I, um, I think we're going to accrete people as we go into the call, as people figure out how to get into our, into our meeting. Uh, Marty, welcome. Hi, thanks. Hi, and I Marty. Wanted to, I wanted to just check in with, um, to go around real quick. And if you'll say your name, like what city you're in, just so we have a little bit of geography. And then one word or phrase that would like somehow summarizes the last month of your life. Like... <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what has the last month of your life been like? Just for a moment, let's, let's give each other a, a second of time. What has your last month been like? And, what, and it, can, it can be like disaster preparation and, and hectic, whatever. It can be you know, calm before the storm. Who knows what kind of, uh, of thing it might be. Uh, but what word or phrase represents the last month for you? Right? And I'll, I'll, I'll start us off. Uh, for me, the last month, um, I think, is about convergence and remix. I, I have this feeling that a whole lot of things are coming together in a very interesting, serendipitous, yet somehow um, understandable way, and that everything I'm doing, I'm busy remixing and shifting around how it's happening in the world. So for me, it's convergence and uh, remix. Uh, Marty, what, what, what's it for you? Well, I like convergence. It's been very intense, and things feel like they're converging at some sort of uh, gateway inside in a really different form. But uh, intense convergence would do it. Mm -hmm. Intense convergence. And you were just outside Sebastopol, right? Yes, yes. And we're watching the winds today. Um, there's some uh, sense that the winds are going to change late this afternoon. And so uh, <laughs> pray for the winds to just stay calm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Winds change. It might blow more this closer to Sebastopol, and um, we're trying not to panic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For anybody who doesn't know, Sebast Sebastopol yeah. is right next to Napa Valley. It's right next to the fires. Uh, yeah. If you throw yeah. a stone across 101, you basically hit Santa Rosa. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Which so went up in smoke uh, just recently. I don't think there's going to be anything left of that town. It's really incredible. Wow. Uh, but yeah, it's right next door. So, so we're watching the winds and um, wondering if we should, we're not anywhere near evacuation zones at this point, but you know, you have in the back of your mind, pack my car, not pack yeah. my car. Well, <laughs> so I would, I would assume your trunk is full of whatever you want to sort of scoot out of there with. Well, we haven't done that yet because we haven't been close enough. So, but, but it's okay. a little bit at the edge of the radar screen today. So neighbors are confirming. Um, but um, Envision quiet winds. It would be lovely. <laughs> okay, we will. We will all envision quiet winds. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. Uh, can you like name city and and the word or phrase that represents the last uh, month? I'm Karen. I live in Kirkland, Washington, which is a little bit outside of Seattle, Washington. And my last month feels like it's been really scattered. Mm hmm. Like parents visiting and stuff going on at work and stuff going on in life and just a million different things that I'm trying to deal with all at once. And it feels like playing whack-a-mole. Whack-a-mole is a feeling I can empathize with heavily. 
Uh, April, do you want to <laughs> dive in? Sure. Um, I'm April. I am in Portland, <coughs> Oregon uh, this morning, which is home base, though, um, let's see, last week I was in Berlin, and next week I'll be in Cape Town, South Africa. So uh, as Rex proceeds, you'll find me dialing in from various spots on the planet. The word for me for the last month, I would say, is some combination of reflective and generative. So I've been lucky that I've actually been traveling less over the last month, which has allowed me to be more um, sort of in creative mode, which for me feels like a real blessing right now. Uh, I don't get enough of just being in one place. Thank you. Uh, Mark? Uh, I'm in Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, Atlantic time zone. Um, last, actually, even before you mentioned convergence, that word popped to my mind in terms of converging on a target, but an interim target. So kind of harvesting a whole bunch of stuff from several directions. Uh, and then and now it's onward because that's just one step. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Bill? Bill, we can't hear you if you're talking, but I hear keyboard tapping away. No Bill yet. Let me go to Todd and Bill, jump in whenever you can keep troubleshooting your audio. Uh, go ahead, Todd. I would say the word for the last 30 days for me is energy. Um, and I think it was represented yesterday. I decided to do a day of fasting uh, just as an experiment and was still uh, incredibly productive and actually moved 2,500 pounds of plaster. Um, so having that energy to be present to family, to be present to clients, and to do a lot of creative destruction in my home, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm very grateful for my health and how it feels like I am fully engaged with life. Love that. And I think Bill just stepped out and was going to try to reconnect so he can get his, uh, his audio back. So let me do a little, um, a little introducing of where we are and why we're here and kind of what's up. Um, partly it's the story of Rex, the Relationship Economy Expedition, uh, and partly really it's the story of, of the opportunity in the world. Um, the, the, more I, the, the more I've chewed on the topic of the relationship economy, the more I've realized that it circles around trust. And we are at a uh, global trust implosion, a global trust deficit. There's kind of an, an opportunity to reconnect the world, to re-understand, um, to reintegrate trust in ways that haven't happened in a really long time. Yay, Bill. Do um, you want to go ahead and uh, say hi, see if we can hear you? I think Bill might be actually just accepting to come join us. There we go. Okay, finally. I've been having technology problems all morning. It's working now. Yeah, good. Okay, so background. I'm with the Center for Social Change in Miami, Florida. We operate in about 11 different states in the United States. We deal with community banks and do community building. So the whole idea of understanding relationships, especially in an econ economic environment, and how you do that in a way that enables uh, the, the, the growth and transcendence of human nature up to a higher level is very much on our mind all the time. We have many, many different projects. We deal with 360 different charities nationwide. We're, we're trying to find inflection points on how we can improve things. And what word or phrase represents or synthesizes the last month of your life? Um, changing. You know, I think that uh, I'm learning things deeper and deeper about what one author calls the internal contradictions of our capitalism and trying to understand where are the real opportunities. So the changing aspect of it, understanding change, understanding systems. I just came back from Wales, you know, working on systems planning issues with David Snowden. So 
change. Love that. And we'll be getting into Snowden and a bunch of other topics as we go. Um, partly, we kind of want to share out what we know and, and the different perspectives, the different pieces of what we've uh, discovered. Um, also, uh, change is really interesting because the Trump administration, in some sense, has kicked up so much mud from the bottom of the river that it feels like everything is plastic. It feels like uh, not everything is going in, in great directions, but there's a real opportunity for change. There's a moment where a lot of things might be uh, done very, very differently from what they were before, which I think hasn't, haven't felt that, that sense of plasticity in the air for, for many, many years. Um, so I think we'll be, we'll be talking about what, what opportunities are presented there and how that all works. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to retell a little story uh, about how Rex came about and how, it's, how we're shifting uh, Rex at this point. Um, basically, um, 20 years ago, I, I was a tech industry analyst, uh, not a Wall Street analyst, but a, a trends analyst. And I realized in the middle of that, uh, hearing probably uh, 4,000 uh, startup pitches, that I didn't like the word consumer. And uh, I, I just noticed that in the middle of all these briefings and consumer this, consumer that, we're going to have consumers do this. I've got a couple of you know, more specific stories that kind of triggered this for me. And um, I paid attention to that word for 20 years. And it gifted me this idea that um, a lot of the heroes I had, people whose work I had really uh, enjoyed, people like David Snowden, uh, Alice Miller, uh, George Fox, the founder of the Quakers, uh, a whole series of, of thinkers, uh, Russell Acuff, Christopher Alexander, and I, I can I have a compendium of, of these thinkers, that they were all basically saying the same thing, that um, we stopped somewhere along the road trusting humans, uh, and that they, each of them, were presenting ways of um, arranging society, whether it was economic or social or decision-making or personal growth or families or whatever, uh, from a basis of trust and a reconnection built on trust. Uh, so a lot, uh, so the, the TEDx talk I've done is called, What If We Trusted You?, which is kind of the question that's been in the back of my mind for the last 15 years, 10 years. Um, and one thing that seems to be an opportunity is um, part of the, the, the inspiration for me to come up with any of these ideas was finding people in the field who were actually doing this work. Uh, the, the kind of the heroes, I call them my contrarians or outsiders, because um, some, of the, some of the forms of, of being in the world run contrary to the majority point of view of, uh, well, in capitalism, everybody should be self-interested and greedy. I mean, the, the traditional uh, classical economic framework that we've kind of built out uh, our systems and institutions with. Um, and when you tell people, well, maybe profit and growth shouldn't be the objectives, or maybe we don't need to imprison our children in schools and put them through the same lockstep all the time, or maybe if you removed stoplights and intersection, uh, traffic would flow more freely and there'd be fewer accidents, all of these things are, are kind of counterintuitive and cause a lot of agita for people who are looking at the world through a traditional capitalist, modernist, uh, even scientist lens. Uh, so there's this huge opportunity right now. And uh, what happened was in 2010, I decided, well, why don't we convene change agents? And uh, I created this, this Rex group. Uh, but for the last seven years, it's basically been a private salon, a private conversation among change agents, where we shared what we were uh, thinking about, what we were doing, and, and dove into ideas that, that were like, I, I refer to it as shining the flashlight through the giant hairball, uh, basically. <laughs> Uh, because the world is, everything is kind of holographic and intertwingled. Um, each of our uh, conversations uh, was a way of looking through this, whether it was a slice of education, whether it was about design and the, the influence of design, whether it was about how do we respond in emergencies, personal growth, a whole series of issues, each of which are, are sort of intertwined uh, uh, in these topics. Um, in the middle of all that, um, actually very, very early in, in thinking about Rex, um, I came up with the six forces of Rex, which are um, free, open, social, abundant, emergent, thrivable. And I'm kind of cheating because the last one, thrivable, actually has three things inside of it, uh, profitable, joyful, and sustainable. So that thriving is sort of a, a compound of those things. And I realized recently um, that Rex wasn't really kind of living up to the six forces. We weren't, we weren't doing any jujitsu um, with the six forces of the relationship economy. We, our conversations were closed. 
Uh, we weren't using social dynamics to connect out to other groups. We weren't uh, uh, building things together. So the shift really is um, into more of a gift economy, a more of a bridge building role, and more uh, through all that, more collaborative sense making. How can we um, come together and ourselves puzzle through some of these hard issues, help the people who are getting work done, uh, who are part of our group, but then put material in the world that other people can use uh, that would be useful uh, in these particular ways. Uh, and I, uh, I've been using my brain for a long time, so I will, um, I will share my, I'll share my brain for a second because um, there are, for example, a whole series of uh, communities that, you know, there are visions that are resonant with Rex. Uh, there are a whole series of examples of communities uh, that have been, uh, here we go, communities and processes that uh, exemplify these kinds of things. So just recently I, I found uh, a label, a voluntary disclosure tool that corporations can use. It's an ethical label from the Living Future Institute, uh, which is run by Amanda, Amanda Sturgeon, whom I haven't met. Uh, these kinds of efforts, if we can begin to tie them together and begin to bring them together with the things that we're doing, point to them at, at worst, uh, actually help them get traction or help them evolve their, their ideas, uh, at, I think at best, would be a really great thing for us to do. And I think that each of us in Rex will get out of it um, whatever we put into it. Uh, so I'm interested in where can we sort of, how can we discover our own superpowers and then how can we actually uh, move toward helping other entities uh, to do these kinds of things. So um, in Rex, and let me uh, stop sharing my screen for a second so we can go back to just conversation. Um, in Rex, what, what I'm going to do is uh, we'll have one call a month as the synchronizing sort of a touch point where uh, whoever can make it makes it, but then uh, we'll, I will begin to uh, do things like interview people and uh, propose questions and create media and run experiments. And I'll put them on the Rex list. And I'll put them on the list where we can all go, oh, that smells interesting. I'd like to be on that call. I'd like to be part of that, uh, that experiment. I'd like to uh, offer just a couple ideas, whatever else it might be. And I'm just doing this, well, partly I'm doing this because I'm compelled to do it. And these are things that I think are really important in the world. But I'm also doing this to model it for all of us because I'd like any of us to pipe up and say, hey, given this framework we're sort of in, there's an open question that I'd like to investigate or there's a person that would be great to interview or bring into the group uh, or whatever else it might be. But what I'd like to do is, is have um, the flow in our conversational list be a, a, a flow of opportunities, of insights, of uh, things that we can do together as we move forward in this world. Um, so partly I wanna encourage you all uh, to jump in. And April, it looks like you have something you'd like to throw in. Yeah, a couple questions. Um, and I guess selfishly, I'm glad to have a call like this, which allows us partly to level set. Um, also, it'll, it's a kind of tutorial for anyone who wants to come watch this later and be onboarded and all of that. Um, I know that in the past, um, you had calls where you would invite a guest in and it would be hosted. And, and I loved, I mean, I love that. Um, obviously, it was more intensive. Will that, how the monthly calls, how will they be focused in terms of, will they have themes like before? Is it more of just a cross group conversation? Um, that's one question. And then secondly, I'm just trying to figure out in terms of, you mentioned the cross group, the channels, the communications, um, love that. Is that going to be more or less like a, um, a list serve or um, does that have different pieces to it, both in terms of technology as well as in terms of convening spots? Um, hi, Michael. Oh, he's just been on his ears. Hey, Michael. <laughs> How are you um, doing? He just put on his ears. That Excellent. sounds nice. <laughs> Thank you. I'll catch you up in just a second. Uh, April just asked a question, so I'm going to answer that. Uh, so one thing I want to emphasize is that everything right now is plastic. Like I, uh, this is an experiment. I really want us to uh, work together to craft this into a better instrument to get our work done together for each of us to get our work done better uh, individually, but also for this group to kind of coalesce and be helpful to other groups and, and sort of pick up there. Um, so um, I will, uh, 
one thing that happens with uh, like interviews when I invite a guest in um, is that if there's only one, maybe the, the, the original classic Rex had two calls a month, which meant there was room for two interviews if we were going to bring two guests in. And that was kind of it, right? I, we weren't doing much out of band. Here, there's an opportunity to do a whole series of interviews where uh, the timing can be set so that whoever really wants to be part of it can join it, et cetera. So I have a feeling that, that guests coming in to uh, be part of a conversation uh, will probably happen ad hoc during the month, wherever they happen. And, uh, and you sort of will post to the list, and the list for now, the Google group, will be the flow where you, everybody can see what's about to happen and say, oh, I'm interested, let's make sure, you know, I'll make sure that it happens when I can participate. Um, one of, one of the, the things that has been uh, sort of a chagrin to me is that um, some people have a standing meeting when we have a call scheduled and they can't actually make the thing that they're really interested in. So we'll do that. And then, um, the structure of our monthly calls is also up for, for design and redesign. I think it's a way to check in and see each other, even though we're not face-to-face -face, you know, uh, in, in person. But it's, it's actually a place to see and hear what we're up to, what's working, what's not working, uh, what we think we'd like to do, all of those kinds of things. Um, so I, again, open completely to designing and redesigning it. One thing I'd like to do is at the end of our monthly calls, um, walk away with something that we'd like to do, walk away with a bit of an assignment so that we have some fun tasks to look, uh, to look forward to. Um, fun is kind of important here. I, I did an interview that most of you are uh, backing me on Patreon, so you saw that I posted recently uh, an interview I did with Audrey Tang, who is a minister without portfolio for the Taiwanese government and is doing some absolutely fascinating work uh, in Taiwan, rethinking democracy and how participation works and all those kinds of things. But the first thing we talked about was something uh, that she's written about called optimizing for fun. Um, and she's, she presents as an anarchist. She says, I'm an anarchist and is, is you know, uh, very forward about that. And by which she means that she believes in emergent structures and that she doesn't believe in giving orders and sort of command and control, but rather creating a setting where people want to jump in, uh, where things happen, and where you kind of flex according to what's happening. And uh, I think that's a really great guideline for, for productive uh, use of our time and productive meetings in different ways. Um, so April, that's partly sort of what's, uh, what's going on here. Um, Michael, I asked people when we first went around, we did a little check-in, uh, just name, uh, geographic, location, and then what word or phrase describes or somehow encapsulates the last month of your life? Could be good, could be negative, whatever you'd like. Um, Michael Lukowitz, I'm in London, Ontario, just outside of Toronto, Canada. Um, and the word would be uh, forced patience. <laughs> Love that. Yeah, it's not really a word, but you know. Yeah. Oh well, no, it's good. In fact, in fact, this isn't a single word. It can be a phrase. It can be. It could be a sentence if you, if you wanted. Uh, no problem there. Um, any other questions? Uh, where we are right this second? And April, go ahead. A follow-up question. So I'm also gathering that, particularly the monthly check-ins are places where somebody else just joined. Hi, Dave. Dave Witzel. Um, there are also places where if any member of the Rex cohort has an idea or a question or, hey, I just want to surface this with other members of the group, that there is a space to do that, which I wouldn't, you know, before it was more structured and led by you, which is fine. I mean, there, this isn't better or worse. It's just, is that right? So if I have an idea that I'm noodling on, Want to bring it to people. I can't control who shows up, but that that it's assuming it's a Rexy kind of topic. That exactly. that would be okay. Okay, and, cool. And I will and I will make every effort to show up and facilitate if somebody wants me to. Um, but really, like go wherever and as much of this as we can. We will record and post together to a single stream, so it looks like a vlog or or a podcast or both, etc., uh, etc. Et but yes, that that's very much the intention. Hey, Mike. Um, uh, Mike and Dave just joined uh, as a check-in um, a little moment ago. Uh, I asked people to say your name, your geographic location on the blue marble, and uh, a word or phrase that describes uh, your last month, uh, the last month of your life. Um, yeah, I see the eyebrows go up. Uh, Mike, do you want to sh shoot first? Uh, I'm Mike Parker. I'm in the UK. 
And the last month has been, let me see, characterized by a convergence of concerns from a number of my clients, all relating to how do we cope with interrelationships when things get tense? Beautiful. Thank you. A great topic. Dave? Uh, Dave Witzel in Oakland, California. Uh, I guess probably uh, kids traveling in strange places. <laughs> and trying to make sure that like, you actually know where they are kind of thing. Well, and, and that they don't get nuked and stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, cool. So um, any, other, any other questions right now where, where we are? Can I make one request? Dave, you look like you're wearing. Can ever, is everyone, I can't actually see Dave. Oh, Dave, the problem like a, is you have your, you're a, you're your windows around you. black triangle. Just shift your, maybe. maybe. Yeah, you, look like, you, look like, you look like Lord Vader yeah. before the cloak comes on in the morning. <laughs> but that's okay. When, no. when, when, when Vader's trying to sort of like keep anonymity going. I'll, I'll go close the shades. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so let me explain a little bit about uh, kind of roles in, in, in Rex. And uh, it's pretty simple, but it, it's kind of different sorts of people here for different reasons in, in different ways. Uh, so all the people who were members of the, the first seven years of Rex, uh, as they come into uh, the, re, the renewed Rex, uh, will be charter members. So we'll see them. Uh, as charter members, uh, that's what we'll, you know, that's, we, we don't have to refer to each other as esteemed colleague, charter member, you know, Bob, Joe Bob, but rather this is just kind of so we know who's in the room and, and how. And uh, uh, I will share with you a, a spreadsheet on the website that has our membership list so far uh, in a moment. Uh, then anybody joining now is a member. And they're, uh, exactly, and Karen is a new member. Uh, Bill, you're actually a fellow. At this point, yeah. So I've, I, we, you were a member in the original thing, but actually your role, for reasons I will explain right this second, um, has changed into that of a fellow. So uh, fellows, uh, there are two senior fellows and will only be two senior fellows. Marty is one of them. Uh, the other is Arthur Brock. Uh, and our fellows basically are in the world building out something that is about the relationship economy. They may not call it that. It's their own mission, their own effort but it falls beautifully and is a, is a fabulous example of the relationship economy at work. So they're on a mission, they have a project, they're teaching people, they're creating uh, matter, media, whatever else it might be that really exemplifies the thesis that we're at. Um, and so, fellow, so there's two senior fellows and I'm now beginning to invite uh, a series of other fellows to come in uh, who are from the communities that inspired this whole idea in the first place. So the goal here is to create a bit of an estuary and um, I had to kind of go, up, go out and look up stuff about estuaries, but estuaries are a really nice metaphor here because the estuaries where salt water meets fresh, uh, you know, bays, places where rivers empty out into the ocean are, are, are estuaries. Um, a, a lot of the world's largest cities are actually located in estuaries, which makes uh, it hard to be an estuary because you get pollution, you get population, you get all those kinds of things. But where, where salt meets fresh is this really nourishing kind of environment where a lot of innovation happens, where nature explores and, and and does interesting things um, where there's a lot of combining of ideas and, and species and so forth. So partly um, metaphorically speaking, the fellows are already well out at sea swimming in some direction on, you know, doing something. And uh, a lot of people in organizations are seeing these energies show up and they're counterintuitive. They don't make a lot of sense from the normal profit maximizing perspective or the normal, uh, there's a whole series of ways in which, in which uh, being open, you know, uh, free, open, social, abundant, emergent, and thrivable doesn't, doesn't engage. And so um, members and uh, charter members are implementing those kinds of things in their organizations. They're learning, they're digesting. And I think that the interaction between these different groups will be super interesting. So part of what I want to do is create a way for us to say, hey, that, that thing you mentioned on the last call or on the list or whatever sounds super interesting to me. Is there a way I might help? Uh, and instead of to jump in, out of band on the side, wherever it happens is, is fine, uh, whatever it might be. But I want to create a, a way that we can see those opportunities and have permission, freedom, agency to go jump in 
uh, and do those kinds of things. So there's senior fellows of whom there will only be two because there were two fellows for the first seven years of, of Rex. And then we'll start to see some new fellows come in. Uh, Bill, uh, Bill Burdett uh, was a member in the first thing, but as you heard from his introduction, he's, he's out there sort of practicing this in Florida and, and other states as well. <clears throat> so so um, it'll work that way. And then there are two more categories of, of participants here. Uh, one of them is catalysts. And right this minute, we don't have any catalysts on the, catalysts on the call. Uh, but catalysts will be younger folk who um, are just, I, I have to say, amazing. And I've had the, the really good luck of uh, meeting a bunch of uh, young folk who are like, have their heads screwed on right and an astonishing way of seeing the world and who will both, I think, bring a, a younger perspective to what we're doing here, but also um, uh, we may benefit their path. I mean, I think there's gonna be a lot of really interesting interactions there. Uh, and one of the people I've invited to be a, a catalyst is actually uh, Dave's son, uh, Zach. So we shall see what country he's in when, when next we speak. Um, and then the last, uh, the last role here is advisors. Uh, Todd has been an advisor to Rex from the get-go. Uh, and so uh, advisors basically um, are struck, they're people who've been really generous with me with understanding what this process is. They're people who are there to, uh, to think of the shape and direction of what we do. Uh, and they're there for, for everyone else to get advice as well. But, but uh, they're, it's, it's kind of a, a different role in the community slightly. Uh, any questions so far? Yes, uh, the young lady on the upper right of my grid screen. Sorry, I'm gonna do this, but this is actually really, I think, helpful for old member, older members, seasoned members and new, newbies. Um, how big is too big? Do you want this to become really, really, really big? Do you want this to, become, to be intimate? Do you want this to have overlapping concentric circles? What's your vision? Because I think the more people, and those of you who know me know that yeah, I, I believe that we're in the early stages of something that's much bigger than any of us and quite emergent and very different than how business has been done and all of that. But I'm also just thinking in terms of um, the intimacy of the Rex, Rex group previously was also really nice. And so just how do we balance um, some of those things? That's fabulous. Thank you. And, and you're asking all the right questions. And we have not, there's been no collaboration on, uh, you're not, these are not prompted or paid questions. These are, um, you, you just know. You I, just have, know. I know, you know, I've, as I've been quite busy in recent um, months and years and, and have observed Jerry, but no, I'm not asking these in any way. I feel this is where, and like I, I, when I introduced myself, I said, I think I'd, I'd like to be a member of Rex whether or not I was married to Jerry. And so I'm asking, I think more with my strategy hat on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I would love to have the problem that we feel like Rex is too big. One of the things that was really good about the first generation of Rex, the first seven years of it, was that it was really intimate. Um, it, you know, you could, we, we kind of, the group that was convening and, and talking knew each other quite well. Uh, the, the conversations felt private and, and small and, and intimate. And I think, that what that did was it created a core group of charter members who have already pretty high trust and high knowledge about each other and can see some of that or carry some of that into the new sphere. Um, the reason to scale back to one group call a month and then have everything else be ad hoc is so that all ad hoc can be as intimate as need be. Does that make sense? So um, somebody will say, okay, I'm, I'm, I, I wanna do an interview with Michelle Bowens. Uh, about a particular question or topic that, that's interesting. And it's gonna happen next Thursday at seven. And then whoever is interested in that particular thing will show up and I, I, it's not going to be probably 100 people unless, you know, unless I get Donald Trump to show up to talk about trust, in which case, you know, the numbers might go up. Um, but I, I think what'll happen is we'll have conversations at, at many different scales and we'll learn really quickly uh, how that works and what's working and, and you know, what to, you know, how to control it for uh, the degree of intimacy that we want. Um, but I would love to make this, uh, it's funny, I had a conversation with a fellow uh, who is, he manages the Aspen First Movers program, uh, which is part of the Aspen Institute, but the, the Aspen First Movers fellows are all business people, mid-career executives, kind of sort of fast track executives who have a sustainability or, or other kind of bent. Um, and he and I both, 
um, came to a conclusion that other people may or may not agree with that there's a bunch of networks that are trying to pull together um, uh, people who are trying to fix the world, change the world. They do a good job recruiting and the people are happy to be in these groups, but I don't think any of them feel like they're really helping leverage the, the individuals in those groups. I think that the, that, that, that the hosts of these groups are really frustrated because they're thinking, oh, we really, we brought everybody together in order to just put, you know, turbo boosters on their feet and see everybody, everybody, you know, jump into the stratosphere. And that doesn't seem to be happening much uh, in the different groups. So if we can begin to cross fertilize, cross pollinate uh, and bridge some of the groups, maybe there's uh, some interesting possibilities from doing that. That implies getting considerably larger because then there might be a bunch of people coming in from Wikipedia, a bunch of other people coming in from some other, some other place. And, and I think that's really an interesting thing to posit. For example, uh, a thought I had years ago when, when Wikipedia got super popular was, okay, good. So now we have a whole bunch of Wikipedian volunteers who have high trust within the system, even though there's plenty of controversy and, and you know, there's a lot of difficult things that go on inside of Wikipedia just because of its nature. But here's a group that's very well grooved to produce one thing. What else might they be interested in doing? What other kinds, of, how, do we, how do we take leverage what they've gotten really good at doing and bring it into other worlds? Those kinds of questions, right? And I think there's a lot of groups like that doing fantastic work uh, in the world. Uh, so that, that's part of it. And I, that may not have answered your whole question. And I'd love to hear what anybody else thinks about, about size uh, here as well. Michael. I love... Um, love, love, love this approach and where you're heading with it. Um, I love a simple anchored thread where we can see your face and come together and uh, have these kinds of conversations and that the whole spirit around all of that is doing great things. Um, and however that happens, uh, you are one of the most extraordinary people at creating that energy and space for things to come together. And so this structure that incentivizes this to happen or that enables it more broadly, um, I'm really excited to see where it goes. I think it's like, it's bang on. I, I've got a bazillion ideas bouncing in my head on ways to engage, but I'm just gonna hold them there right now. <laughs> Fabulous, thank you. I really appreciate that. Jerry? No. <laughs> I, I tend to be more toward trying to find ways to act on what we learn. Uh, we actually call our sort of center for social change a social, social lab, so that we're trying out different things. What I'd like to suggest, because you seem to have a flexibility, a plasticity that, that enables you to have different segments of this, and what I'd like to offer is the willingness to use some of my staffing and everything to support somebody's perception of what next they want to do. In other words, I love the variety of things that we touch on, but sometimes I sense that I don't hear what came from that. And if somebody could say, okay, I'm, I'm going to have a takeaway. I'm going to, I would like to do this, but I need this kind of support or that kind of support. And to an extent, as we probably all know from nonprofits and everything, capacity building is the basic problem. In other words, they don't have accounting. They don't have some extra time to do an extra project. In other words, it always takes time. And so if, if I can sort of maybe at least initially volunteer some of our staff to help on a particular project, in other words, if somebody comes up with a concept, then that might help people to get involved because it's not like the Aspen situation, you know, where, okay, we got all these people together, but what happened? Right. You know, I mean, I, I'd, I'd like us to be known as a happening place, not just a thinking place. Well, uh, when I started uh, Rex, I described it as a think and do tank. And in, in retrospect, it became a think tank. It became a salon or a conversation. We, I wasn't putting the energy in for the doing. We weren't organized for the doing, all those kinds of things. So I, I absolutely appreciate your offer of resources when we start figuring out what to do. And I'd love, like, just, just sort of thinking out loud, Marty, 
you have a zillion things in your head that would be fantastic if they found their way into the world as things people could do to reconnect with the earth, with each other, et cetera. That would be like somatic, <clears throat> physical, perceptual exercises. Maybe, uh, maybe one or two of those we could produce nicely um, in, in ways, you know, uh, figure out who want, who's interested in, in doing this and then riff on it <clears throat> so that, um, you know, so that there's one manifestation which looks like one, one would expect, but then we invite people to come in and take the ideas and remix them in some way. I'm, I'm just like, how could we um, do these different kinds of things in, in ways that, that draw on our creative energies, that, uh, you know, help us actually sort of all um, pull together on these things? And, and sorry, Marty, go ahead. Marty, we don't hear you. You're muted. Mouse over your screen and now, there Perfect, now, now, now we hear you. I, I have a gazillion things in my head. Um, the two at the top of the list are, um, one is to uh, find really high level leaders and influencers who are willing to be intensely trained and immediately bridge the training into their businesses. So yeah, it may, may be connecting to the earth and that stuff, but the immediate bridge has to be into how we create value and how we distribute it um, and um, into our collectivity. And I want that to be small and intense and really highly qualified people. So that could be an extraordinary um, institute that's part of the whatever Rex is becoming and it would be spectacular. Um, the other thing is a project. I need a bunch of designers. I need really good designers and tech people. Um, it's a project to create uh, in the current vision, maybe five 60 a second videos that explain the organizing principles of consciousness in ordinary language. And I need a team for that. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. Really. So those are the biggies right there. Love that. So uh, just, I use the occupy hand signs a lot. And when I give speeches, I teach these to the audience because it, <laughs> then, they, then they stop being an, a mere audience and they're a little more connected to the speaker. Yeah. So this means, yeah. this means I agree. Yeah. This means I disagree. Yeah. This means, mm -hmm. eh, so, so. <laughs> um, I'm glad you didn't do this. <laughs> Yeah. No, no, no. I'm, I'm totally on board. I love this idea. Yeah. Um, so yeah. one of the nice things about being on Zoom is that if we're all sitting here being grim, that's one thing, but we can at least see each other's faces and that's cool. <laughs> but if we start doing some gestures and just sort of monkey around a little bit, I think it, uh, it would be great. It'll, it'll liven up our conversations. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. it also I gives you a... I have to comb my hair, so... <laughs> you know what? A April has a similar problem with the with the morning. The morning Zoom is not a happy thing for April. Right, exactly. Okay, April, let's unite. <laughs> I mean, exactly. basically, you're going to see me looking like I've just done yoga. But yeah, I, yeah. I enjoy, you know, I actually enjoy seeing, I will admit, Govin, like, Bill, I've never actually, I've never met you in person. And I'm like, oh, finally, there's Bill. That's awesome. So I think if we all get over, if I get over myself and we all get over our respective morning <laughs> selves, we'll be fine. Yeah. And, and also the way technology is going, we're all going to be like, like lip syncing puppy avatars anyway. So, you know, we might as well take advantage of the brief moment in history where we actually could see one another through a barely mediated, uh, you know, lens at the same time. So I, I like that a lot. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Uh, go ahead. Yeah. If I could re respond to Marty's comments, um, both of those things that you mentioned, the, the leader training and the videos and everything, I think that we could, we've got people that can contribute to that. In other words, we've got a group that we sponsor that's yeah. called Tech Versify that basically teaches videography to students. Mm -hmm. So they could probably put this into their project bin as something that they could, they could be doing. So if Fantastic. you have any, you know, information about that, I'll put you in touch with the woman who runs that. Great, thank uh, you. But on the leadership training thing, um, I'd also be interested because to an extent, that that's sort of like basic, uh, you know, capacity building 101. In other words, mm -hmm. if they don't yeah. know what they need to know in order to help others, then you're sort of like at a, at a loss. So yeah. I mean, I'd be interested in, in collaborating with you on what that means. Fabulous. All right, so, great. I'll, I'll get in touch with you. Okay. So one of, one of the ways to do this, and I'm thinking now about our process together, um, mm -hmm. 
For example, Marty, you could say, hey, here's a question I'm trying to answer and propose that to uh, the rec list. And if you wanted to, you could also do this as a private side conversation, but you could say, hey, I'd like to investigate this question and ways of manifesting this, ways of expressing it. Mm -hmm. And then whoever's interested shows up for a Zoom call. Yeah. Um, and then you not only, you present what you think it is and how you think you want to go about doing it, but then also mm -hmm. other people riff on that and say, well, how about if you, if you tried this other way of, of getting to the same goal? How about yeah. if, yeah. and I don't know what the ifs might be, but I yeah. think that if, if we're all helping each other be creative with our goals, uh, and, and offering very interesting alternate means to get to those goals. I think we're going to have really interesting times here. And then yeah. from the conversation a moment ago, kind of about if, you know, if only we could get senior leaders to do X, um, mm -hmm. kind of what the moment is right now in the world is there's a global general reconsideration of the social contract. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. like people everywhere are realizing that like shit is bullshit and fucked up, which is my favorite mm -hmm. sign from Occupy. Um, Donald Trump, the, the apex predator of consumer mass market capitalism, is currently the president of the United States because enough people thought that things are broken in this country that they voted for somebody who might actually break it. It's my own, my own theory about sort of why, we're, why we have him there, right? So, so this is a gigantic conversation that we probably can't process and solve perfectly for anybody, but we might actually be able to set a table where people can come in and understand what the menu of offers is. Uh, and instead of the stupid false dichotomies of it's either socialism or full on capitalism to, to understand what groups in the world are doing interesting work. I mean, that, that's why I, one of the reasons I loved my conversation uh, with Audrey Tang uh, in, in Taiwan was that we went into these things and I left the conversation thinking, okay, this really opens up a lot of super interesting options for how we might have civic participation in genuine decision-making around issues that matter. Terrific. Mm -hmm. um, so, so how might we not only have the specific conversations, but then frame the conversations in ways that allow us to experiment and allow other people to come in and use what we create as resources uh, mm -hmm. for decision-making. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Um, I think you asked how might we frame the conversations. I actually think we're already framing the conversations and we need uh, we need to move to action way faster. So cool. I, th I think so many of us are ready to just actually take some action. Um, I think the question, we're beyond it. Yeah, so I, I own the domain fireaim.net, which I bought years ago. April knows <laughs> I, I, I parked too many domains in the world. But the notion... <laughs> But, but my saying, I think the saying for the current world is um, fire aim never quite ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. in the old world, it was ready, aim, fire. And that implies a whole series of things about process, about, okay, we're going to prepare for the thing now. We're going to aim with care. But the, the ready was like, what are you aiming at? What, what is your, what, 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 everything else. And then you fire and then you yeah. correct and then you fire. Now it's like, Fire aim never quite ready, which means go do some things, take some action. Well, exactly. I mean, the, the world adjust. is yeah, the world has kind of come to a screeching halt because people believe that they could be prepared for something they've never experienced before, and the only way we learn anything is to have an experience. So, yeah, I think the the ready needs to go. And we well, the never quite ready also also means that it's just going to be really uncomfortable. It's really going to be uncomfortable. You know, oh, the, the never quite ready also means you're, you're always feeling a little off balance. Yeah, but that, see, that changes when consciousness changes. So <laughs> it's, it won't hurt too exactly. much is what I try to tell people. <laughs> yeah. So Karen, Karen has to uh, leave our call to go to a meeting and just said on the chat, um, uh, which I think everybody can see, but uh, you might not have turned on the chat. I've got it set so that there's the, the grid display with everybody's faces and then the chat on the, on the right for me. But she just said she needs to hop off. But might it make sense for this monthly call to be a bit of a large accountability, accountability system? Uh, sort of like over the next month, I'm going to do X. Uh, and then at the beginning of the next call, we actually check in and see how those things went, which is a, an experiment I'd be very happy to, uh, uh, to try. Then unfortunately, you're not going to be here for the end of the, the next 30 minutes of our call. Uh, but we can, we, can, we, can, we can try that out next month or... Uh, See, look, I make a suggestion, call. which means other people have to do things. <laughs> and I go away. Bye. You're a good anarchist already. <laughs> <laughs> See you next time.
next month, yeah. everyone. Thank you very much. I have to go to a meeting for the job that pays me money. As it is. Um, so any, any other thoughts about the topic we were just on, about how to do, how to, you know, a bias for action, which I love. Um, I, I will start putting things on the list that are, and I'm interested here in what action means, because for example, um, I've got three or four topics that I'm creating presentations around that I just want to record the way I've been doing uh, with Prezi and with, uh, you know, screencasting and, and whatnot uh, to put out, out in the world. And uh, uh, one of them is about a denial of discourse attacks which is uh, basically I, I borrow the denial of service idea and I say, look, how do you have discourse when some parties are actually trying to destroy discourse? And I call that a denial of discourse attack. So I'm going to create some media and, and, and uh, put it online. Uh, that's a kind of action in that producing media is a form of action. Um, but what other kinds of things are up for us to jump in with each other on? So I would love to, to talk to something you and I have spoken about over the last few months, Jerry. Um, with the old incarnation of Rex um, was by default Jerry driven. And in order for this vision that you've shared and that has come together, um, it's still Jerry led, but it's member driven. Um, so our responsibility is, is not for you to wait for the structures that enable us to give and receive what we need, it's for any of us to step forward and say, let's try this, just like Karen just did, or just like Marty just did with Bill. And, but this is gonna require a change of habit um, because we have relied on you organizing, packaging, presenting, um, and I know you want something different now. You are exactly right. You are exactly right. And I'm happy to see what emerges and happy to um, use my skills in whatever way are appropriate for whatever things emerge, et cetera, et cetera. Michael. Yeah, so I mean, on, on that, I have two uh, projects that are um, going and um, part of what I'm trying to figure out is what's the right way to engage within with the community? Because they're things that I'd love to open up specifically because it is this community. And so there's two things around that is one is uh, what are, do we have some core protocols because I'm not sharing them publicly uh, very publicly yet or, or only in specific ways. So do we have sort of core protocols around how we share? And then second, is there uh, a more asynchronous way that's more appropriate to be able to put out there what's going on um, so it's there and it can be a reference point or for other people to come as they come in to be able to check in on things. Fabulous. Uh, so uh, yes and yes. Uh, at this point, the, the new Rex list, the Google group is private. Um, and I, I, I've made it that way partly so that we have a place to, to do what you just said, which is to share stuff that, uh, that's pre-public. Um, so there's that. And then the exercise I was going to ask us to do at the very end of today was actually to pair up with somebody else and then uh, to book a time sometime to get together and create a profile for uh, the Google site. And I will, I'll, I'll put a much more detailed explanation of this on the Rex list, but I'd love for us to have a page on a common website where it isn't your LinkedIn profile, because that already exists, by the way. And it isn't your, you know, there'll be links to the, to the places where you've already got some manifestation online. Your profile in Rex should be um, some combination of some side of you that lets us feel who you are, um, some notion of what your superpowers are, what are you good at, um, and some notion of the things you're working on that we might be able to go help with, the kinds of projects that you just described, uh, Michael. Um, and we sort of need to experiment our way to how public is that, uh, how does that go, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I, think, I think there being a place online, and, and partly what, uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about at the end of the call was our infrastructure, like our, tech, our, our techie infrastructure. And right this minute, as a start, I'm falling back on the place I've come back to because I'm so done with WordPress. I can't tell you, um, you know, there, there's so, so many, like good platforms are apparently still really rare, really hard to come by. 
So the, the place I've come back to is a Google group as a conversational mailing list. Most people have a Gmail address. It seems to work. A few people are, are Google refuseniks, which is a problem, but those people are usually in the, in the, in the minority. And then I'm, I've built a small Google site, which I'll send everybody a link to, um, which right now is completely uh, bare bones. I'm, I'm trying not to put too many things in there so that I don't overbuild, so that we actually um, uh, build it, sort of build out the things we think we need. Uh, and that's where I'll put um, my profile and some other, some other profiles. Uh, so Mike has to bounce as well. Um, thank you. Thank you for being on the call, Mike. Um, totally appreciate it. Um, so I will put some things on there. And then um, I'm completely open to whatever other tools, instruments, methods we'd like to use. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of leading our way into these waters and then listening for what works, what doesn't work, uh, following ideas, opinions. I mean, uh, you know, Mark, you, like me, have been uh, in this world for a, quite a while, since, since kind of early days. And you have a sense for what's out there and what people have tried and not tried, what works and what doesn't work. So, you know, advice you have about uh, everything from, from tools to norms and all that would be completely great. Uh, and we can have that conversation out loud on the, on the list or we can, you know, uh, book a call and, and ponder these things ourselves. Um, but, I, but I think this makes a, a whole bunch of sense. Other thoughts? Michael. <laughs> Here I go again. Um, okay. I think one, one, of the, one of the things that I, um, I think is our biggest untapped potential is the ability to um, f actively facilitate connections uh, um, within our networks. Um, that specifically, I think, is one of the most powerful things that that brings because it carries the spirit of understanding of how we're coming at this and that very powerfully can inform uh, who the right connections would be. So, for example, if I get an incoming in, uh, in, uh, connection request from someone within this group, I'm going to take that very seriously and, and with a different intent than I would anything else. Um, and I think that, uh, that that is our one of the most powerful forms of action we could do. So explicitly being able to activate and that, that in some way is very interesting to me, however, whatever that looks like. Because I'd be happy to try and work on facilitating introductions for anybody in the group as well, likewise. Um, I just don't know how we enable that. I'm struggling that with that another project as well, so I don't have answers. Yeah, I think that's a, a great and sort of central thing to what we're up to. Because as I said earlier, there's sort of, there's community. I, I'd, I'd like, if this even makes sense, partly to address April's question about how big is too big, I'd like this to be a community of communities where there's high trust when we're together doing this work and where we're busy making those synaptic connections across these various networks or those mycelial uh, connections, if you want to use like rhizomal networks or other metaphors. Um, but I think that, that uh, being able to make these connections is essential to our work. Uh, can anyone else, uh, so I think this notion resonates for us, but can anyone else put some more meat on the bones, meaning uh, describe how a fruitful way of making these connections might work for us? Because one of my superpowers is I'm a connector. Like in you know, Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point, he describes what connectors do, and I'm, ah, I'm a connector. I, I do that a whole bunch, and I'm very happy to do it. Don't always know whom I need to connect for what, right? Maybe we should, uh, maybe you should invite John Husband along to uh, talk about wirearchy. That's interesting, yeah. Uh, one thought I've been uh, toying with, and actually like trying to write up some framework and stuff around it, but the, um, I, I was trying to, like, how do you, I was, how do you uh, weaponize a networker, you know, like, like you, Jerry, how do you, you know, mm -hmm. make that high value? Um, and, and I don't really know. I mean, it's, you know, there's a couple of problems, like how do you just get your impact out there? And also how do you pay for yourself something like that? But um, what one, one framework I've been wondering about it is could we host uh, virtual consultations, you know, they would look just like this, but somebody comes in with a specific problem that they're dealing with, and then you convene a 
bunch of folks to uh, to consult with them. So could Rex offer, you know, to the world basically the op the opportunity for an hour of consultation amongst people who think about interesting things, and we get the benefit of hearing interesting things and meeting interesting people, and you're trying to provide a consultative service to them. Um, and I, you know, I think there's actually probably an actual, con, you know, convene, you know, you, you get better at that structure and you're able to offer value within an hour or something like that. Yeah. Um, so, so there's different ways of doing this. And uh, you just reminded me that for a long time, I've had this wish list item that I just, I just shared screen on my brain, but I, I, I had less in there than I thought I did. This notion of power tools for connectors. Uh, and so I'm, I'm a connector. Um, when I meet a new human being, the work I have to go through to integrate them with my software is stupid. Like the, the, number, the, the number of places I have to enter them, et cetera, et cetera. And then when I want to you know, convene a group or do whatever, it's just way too much work. So uh, one thing that would be really lovely would be to think about, um, if, if, as you talk about how do we weaponize a, connect, a network or a connector, um, we could put out wish list items for uh, software or standards that ought to exist. Um, this is stuff that I think LinkedIn could have done, should have done, and any, you know, I think there's many business plans right now uh, sort of boiling over that are, we're, we're going to do LinkedIn right, right? Because LinkedIn did one thing right, they replaced the resume. So everybody's resume is now their LinkedIn page. That happened. But everything else LinkedIn has done has not really thrived. They've not done a bunch of other things well, and now they're owned by Microsoft, which to my mind has a notable black thumb with software. So there's an opportunity here to do stuff like that. Um, so that, that, that's, that's sort of riffing on, on the idea of, of weaponizing networkers in, in one direction. But I'm interested in what everybody else is, uh, is thinking this stuff again. I think we need to provide some direction on the Google group um, that we encourage people to post help needed. And that could be help with a connection, help with a concept, uh, help with a tool. Um, but just for people to, to know that that's part of the purpose of the group is to ask for help because the asking for help and responding to help is what helps build connection too. Uh -huh. Yeah, one of the related, I was just listening to a, an interview with Neil Garanflow the other day and he was talking about the beginning of Shareable and how the part of the beginning of Shareable was a series of, um, they were hosting events and they were doing gift exchanges at the events. So organization. Mm -hmm. Asking, offering for, for, for help and everything. And it seemed like that's a really, especially in something like this where you want to be a, a network of networks, something kind of concrete like that creates the contacts and uh, reinforces the relationships. And, you get and uh, uh, sort of ironically, one of our members, one of our uh, charter members is Mans Mansour, who, who has sort of put all of his life energy and, and funds into a, a network he calls Cape 66, which is all about haves and wants, haves and needs. Uh, so he's trying to make a go of it as a single purpose for uh, the network that he's constructing. So we could, you know, bring, bring him into the conversations as well in those ways. Other thoughts? Uh, other, one thing that's worth all of us reflecting on and feeding back to the, Google, the, the, the Rex list, I think, is um, what have we seen and experienced in our lives in the world that works? You know, there are groups that have interesting practices. And I, I know I've borrowed many a practice from one place and brought it to another place. I'm, you know, I, I think of that as cross-pollination. <clears throat> you know, uh, I had a household, uh, uh, five guys shared a house in West Philly when I was in grad school. And one of the guys had, had been in a really high function a house in, uh, at York University in Canada. And he brought with him these practices and we adopted them wholesale. And they've really stuck with me for, you know, for a long time. And they were different from your normal ways of, uh, uh, of doing things. So how might we share good practices so that we can get, go try them out? Yeah, one thought I'm having is about uh, this idea of connections and... Uh, um, I guess that relates also to the number of connections. Um, like Jerry, your brain has what three hundred forty thousand or so. Hi. <laughs> um, 
and and uh, so that that's kind of a a challenge in itself. And uh, so uh, I think one one pattern uh, that's emerging more and more is that of uh, being cellular or starting at a kind of small level. And that's something that, for example, I think the Meta Currency Project and the Scepter people, Art Brock and so on, are, are very much into, which to me makes a lot of sense, especially in terms of, for example, how you relate to privacy and uh, pervasive surveillance and so on. Um, and that also relates to how to be, how to create organisms. So, uh, so the, the fruit of connectivity uh, maybe you can see as the mush as the mushroom that comes out of the mycelium is is something visible, and so the activity underneath then creates something. So maybe that's related to kind of the action component of thinking, um, and uh, so I think that's kind of another aspect of uh, uh, how do you cre create a form that has a kind of life and integrity of its own. And I think in terms of political institutions, that's certainly a challenge. Um, and, and also in, in terms of action, how, how do you have action that's not reactive uh, this, or that's not purely reactive, um, but that emerges out of some kind of resynthesis or paradigmatic shift um, or kind of newly perceived uh, openness to some possibility. Um, so I think it's a matter of how you create forms essentially uh, and part of that thinking is that, you know, what, what persists in our world really is institutions. Um, you know, you have the pyramids can last a few thousand years. Um, but in terms of our, what lasts and what has lasting effect, it's institutions. And again, that's a kind of question of how we as human beings can create these new kind of meta organic forms. Um, so I realize th those are kind of, large and maybe abstract thoughts, but uh, um, that's the kind of stuff I'm thinking about, basically. Those are, those are great, great, great thoughts. Let me just talk uh, about institutions for a second. I'm hearing my voice echoing in someone's background. Um, there's a book called The Institutional Revolution, which was about the pre-modern British aristocracy. I read it a few years ago, and it was fascinating. It was like, why did those British aristocrats do such stupid things? They had dueling, they didn't teach their kids anything interesting, they hunted with the fox and the hounds, they had very expensive parties, and it turns out that all of the institutions created around that time were to create trust at a distance in an era where you couldn't tell what was happening at the other end. So you needed to know that Sir Francis Drake was acting for the queen and not on his own interest when he was half the world around and you weren't going to hear for three months whether he was still alive or not. And so those sets of institutions, which were really crusty and hard to change, gave us rural Britannia for multiple hundred years. It's super interesting. Um, when we talked earlier about, when I, when I mentioned earlier that we're sort of rethinking, renegotiating the social contract, part of that is these institutions. Part of that is also the scripts in our heads that are part of consumerism, which we're kind of buried in the heart of. And there's very clever and interesting hacks to do uh, that, that can come, you know, work through the cracks. Uh, the more you talk about institutions, sometimes I think the more impenetrable they seem. And yet, I think that they can be um, hacked and cracked and changed. I think that the scripts in our heads can be changed. And one of, one of my beliefs actually is that once somebody has had a felt sense of agency again, once they've done something in the, in the broad menu of relationship economy projects, from the sharing economy to open source software to traffic calming to unschooling to whatever, once somebody's had a felt sense of agency in one of them, I think that puts them in a different place and they start looking at the world a little differently and looking for that sense again somewhere else, except they don't really know that it's available in all these different places. And, and, and part of my frustration is I see it happening in all these places and I haven't been able to sort of weave that and put it in the world yet as, look, it, th this thing is actually everywhere. We can do instit inst institutional change, I think, from a very grassrootsy way while also trying to engage, as Marty was saying earlier, the leaders at the top to begin to see and perceive differently and reward differently and hire differently and plan differently. But that's a, that's a pretty big ask for people who are buried in the middle of systems that don't reinforce, you know, Wall Street does not reward the kinds of behaviors we're talking about here. It's structurally, structurally different. So I think it, I love the word institutions. Um, Ethan Zuckerman would be a really good person to talk to about this. He talks about sort of 
institutional revolutions and, and rethinking these things. Uh, but I want to I want to pick up that thread and, and uh, throw it into our, our conversations a lot. So thank you, Mark. Another possible angle. Um, I wonder if we could get some of this conversation into existing um, you know, conference settings. So I'm going to go over and explore SOCAP today. I don't know if there's a setting there. I was I got I met Josh. Uh, I was having I chatted with Josh from Bioneers last night and gave me a free ticket to Bioneers next week. So I'll, I'll go over. I've never been to either one, so I'll go check it out. But he and, and it seems like Bioneers in particular might be a candidate for kind of. I don't know if it's more of a panel or a track or, you know, some kind of, and, and, and I was going to, I was going to push Josh on, like, are there, are there kind of like co-branded other next generation things you could do, you know, around regenerative, right. Kind of in my training, but um, they would, they would help, you know, leverage what they've already built, but make it more. Uh, I've always wondered why these events don't have exponential curves, right? I mean, do they get dramatically better or not? What's that look like, you know? And, and what would a learning curve for conferences look like, kind of? Um, so I don't, I don't know if that's the right question to be asking, but it seems like there's fodder for, for playing with. I like it. I'm trying to capture some of your questions in the, in the chat. Other thoughts? What, um, What else might we do here to experiment with these things? I, li I really like the ideas that have come into the conversation. This, this is totally random, but I think one of the, it's a different tack. One of the things that I continue to be just so fascinated by is where are there Rexy places in the world? And I don't really know how that manifests. I mean, except in our respective travels and that sort of thing. But that thread that as the community expands, I just, like the stuff that doesn't make the headlines, the places that aren't about becoming the next, you know, smart, green, whatever, whatever city, more, and, but I don't want to call it neighborhoody, and I don't want to call it necessarily grassroots. It can be all sizes, all skills, every single flavor. But this concept of collecting, like, a map, I would love this. And this is very selfish for me because I love maps and I love travel. Like, having a map, a Rexy map of the world or map of the Rex universe or I would love – again, as, a, as the community expands to be able to crowdsource some of that stuff, because I continue to find that a really rich, robust, um, both potential resource, but way of thinking. And, um, you know, I have my own running list of Rexy places, which I'm happy to share with everyone else. Some of them I visited, others I have not. Um, but I just want to throw that into the mix, because it's one of those things that I feel like Partly it's a project, partly it's a request, partly it's one of those through thread themes that I want to make sure um, is kept alive. And I, um, I keep a list of these sorts of places in my brain and in this brain as well. Um, I think maybe sort of pilgrimages, virtual or real, to some of the communities that are doing this, in fact, mm -hmm. will be extremely important. Yeah. Uh, really interesting. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and there's, there's just so many places in the world doing interesting things to learn from. Michael, can you ask your question? Uh, can, you, can you say what you mean by something that aggregates social networks? Yeah, so, I mean, even a simple example. So if you've got a, uh, a team that you're working with and is there a tool that will say they can all connect their LinkedIn's and we can explore the collective social network? Like, I mean, the actual human networks that are already identified because to me, it feels like like the map you're talking about, April, is actually already described in the networks that all of us have. And no, we're not; they're not all Rexy people in that. But it's it's those those would be incredibly powerful patterns um, if we could surface. And I've I've wanted that for a number of things um, repeatedly, and it feels like that would be the best gold mine that we could have and easy to set up if it existed. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, LinkedIn protects its network um, uh, viciously. Like they, they don't want people scraping the whole LinkedIn network and using it that. It's scrapable now. 
They lost that- a they, they, they lost a case. It is now oh. scrapable. They actually legally lost the case that they can't, they're not allowed to prevent scraping. Oh, sweet. Okay. <laughs> That's fabulous because they've really been missing the march on what that could offer, what that could create. But uh, historically, they've seen that network as the crown jewels. And that's why they've defended it so, so badly. Um, so now that it's open, let's figure out who's, uh, who's using it. That's great. Well, one of the things about the brain is that it would make a really nice front end to browse LinkedIn, right? Im- imagine you could switch the brain over to go cruise through people's networks. Who were your first degrees uh, in LinkedIn? That's super yeah. interesting. I, I think that's exactly it. I mean, to me, that it's in that core because us choosing to affiliate with somebody is one level to express like the common values, the commonality, and that then layering on the interest graphs and everything else. I mean, that, and it, to me, it gets to, I think the most, the most actionable and powerful thing in this community is to facilitate these connections. Um, So whatever we do to enable that, I think is, is how we can rather more important than our ideas or our methods or anything else is us to do work with others like us and have that be the way that we, that this influences and spreads in the world. Like, like Dave's suggesting, Dave's suggesting that us uh, having people have conversations about this at conferences, getting those voices out there, et cetera. Like, I, I think it's, it's us getting out there and helping each other collectively get out there in some way and building those, strengthening the ties between us and our, those that were in common is um, that's, that's my dream in this. Love that. I really love that. Um, yeah. I always wanted to have like a God's eye view of the LinkedIn database and, you know, and say like, who are all the, who, who's work, who's working on regenerative agriculture. And, you know, let me see the entire world of that. And yeah. I can't, I can only see my first and second degree connections. Back, so it would be, it would be so really what, Sorry. So one of my immediate goals um, is to approach some of the communities that have been doing the work that inspired uh, the relationship economy idea and try to find three people in each of these communities and invite them into the conversation. I just want three people who kind of get it where we have some simpatico on these ideas. I don't want to invite 50 people in. I'm not sure we can figure that out. But if, if two of the three people show up and we begin to integrate it's more one person, not enough. One person uh, kind of alone and they can't convince other people in the organization. They have to integrate and resell. Three people from a group like Wikipedians, like, you know, whatever, OpenStreetMap, like what have you, uh, like uh, the art of hosting, for example, a terrific community. Um, three people brought in here will, um, I think, uh, create some of the connective juices that you're talking about, Michael. And I'm pointing down here because you're down here to me, but who knows where I am to you right now? This video thing, I don't know, it's, it's hard, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Never mind, I forgot, I lost it. Lost the throat. Lost oh, it. shoot, you laughed and it fled. Anyone else? We're getting close to the end of our, of our call. Um, partly what I want to do, and I think, I think I'll just do this on the, um, on the Rex list, and I'm going to do a little bit of social engineering. I will random, I, I will not randomly, I will kind of do a little social engineering and pair people up. Uh, and I will first create a, my own idea of what a profile might look like and search, sort of show you where it is. Uh, but I will ask people uh, for next month to pair up and, and help each other complete your profiles. Um, one part of that is a belief I have that most people are not aware of their, usually their strongest superpowers. Um, we, you know, we're nowhere good at uh, presenting something because we studied it hard, we do whatever else. But, but for example, my, my better half, April, um, thinks that everybody can remember what they were doing this day for the last seven years. And I don't remember what I was doing this day seven days ago without consulting my calendar. I have no idea, no idea. So one of April's major superpowers is, is this calendric genius where she just, time is her friend. Time is, her fr- time is my enemy. Time is her friend. So she might not know to put that down on a profile as a superpower. So I'm trying to figure out what exercises do we create so that we can discover one another's superpowers and add to them over time on, each, on one another's uh, profiles, for example, uh, you know, things, things of that nature. Um, because then we can sort of look around and go, you know, who's, who's really good at changing other people's minds? That could be a superpower, you know? 
somebody who's really good at selling ideas, as long as they believe in the ideas, uh, whatever else it might be. So let, let's see if we can aim for some of that tactically. And I think what that does is it makes future networks more actionable. It, it, lets, it lets us convene teams more quickly. It lets us know more quickly who we are. Uh, a few people in Rex will become sort of human routers because they'll be really curious about everybody and their superpowers. They'll go around and look at all of them. And there'll only be one or two people who, under, who know the breadth of, of talent available, but they'll help us do this as well. So I'm, I'm thinking in that way. Any thought or feedback on this? It's worth the effort. Yeah, I think so too. And then- Can't and you just start pretty simply and ask, I mean, part of it is self-identifying superpowers. And like, I know now thanks to being with you, that I have a calendar brain and I do, and I, I've never taken it for granted once I realized that you don't have one. So that's <laughs> helpful, right? Um, but at the same time, I mean, I guess I'm thinking just about a very simple version 1.0 kind of hack of this, which is self-identify half a dozen superpowers that you believe, you know, don't be bashful, go ahead and do that. Yep. And each of us to cross identify, not that we know everyone else, but each of us knows a couple people in this cohort at least to have others self-identify what we see those superpowers are. And then you've got, you know, a basic thing. Mm -hmm. I'm also thinking about this, not just, I mean, I think Marty has more superpowers than any human being I know. Uh, <laughs> You're too kind. That ability to see. But then I'm also thinking about more practical stuff, which is like, who tells a really good story? Or exactly. Tells a really good joke. Like these are things that I'm discovering are really important for me professionally, and I'm not a natural joke teller. So I would love to get you know. So it's that kind of thing as well. Um, so maybe there's a sort of maybe three layers. One being self identification. The other being uh, group identification of superpowers. And the final one being, and you know, maybe this is more like a wish list, but what are those superpowers you'd love to be able to source within the community? So one thing is, what's, what is your growing edge? What superpowers would you love to have or have access to? Mm -hmm. but, but there's also like, you know, there's, there's things that each of us probably wants to get better at. And if we yeah. can put those forward, I think and that helps not too. Necessarily, what I want to call out though, is they're not necessarily Rexy in themselves. And yeah. I don't. I don't want to call them all about professional development or certainly not networking or strategy. And I'll, I will just use the example of knowing, yes, there are people who do an amazing job of helping people learn how to tell stories. So I think storytelling is a key skill, but even going beyond that, just something like, um, well, I use the example of telling a joke that might be oversimplifying, but something like that, which doesn't fit neatly into any particular bucket. But, um, you know, I think, Marty's work around translating difficult concepts into things that don't require many words, for example, or like that's again, it's a superpower, but I'd like to translate it in different ways. Anyway. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, closing thoughts? And I think I'll read the poem again as a, as a close because not everybody who's on now was on at the start. Any other thoughts? Cool. Um, this is exciting. Uh, so I will, uh, at the very start, I read the summons by Robert Francis, which is a poem we read at our wedding. And I think um, given how we've been talking about what this could be, I think you'll see even more now that, that this is the kind of energy we, we would like. Keep me from going to sleep too soon. Or if I go to sleep too soon, come wake me up. Come any hour of night, come whistling up the road, stomp on the porch, bang on the door. Make me get out of bed and come and let you in and light a light. Tell me the northern lights are on and make me look. Or tell me clouds are doing something to the moon they never did before and show me. See that I see. Talk to me till I'm half as wide awake as you and start to dress wondering why I ever went to bed at all. Tell me the walking is superb. Not only tell me, but persuade me. You know I'm not too hard to persuade. Thank you very much. Um, see you on the list. I will offer a bunch of guidance. Put 
whatever questions you have, throw them on there. I'll answer them. We'll answer them for each other. Um, but thank you. This is a, a lovely kickoff. Thanks, Al. Bye-bye. Thank you, Al. Bye.